Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a Twitch star joining us this week. He's also the former 2016 National High School co-champion, 2017 Minnesota State champion. Uh, Our guest, Andrew Tang, earned the title of Grandmaster in November of 2017. He's one of the top 50 classical players in the U.S. Um, As we record here on September 7th, he's tied for number one on the (laughs) chess.com bullet leaderboard with a rating of 3,374. Uh, tied with a gentleman named Hikaru Nakamura um, and 21 years of age. Uh, he is signed with the esports organization Cloud9, has 50,000 Twitch followers, and of course is known best, as we just alluded to, for his bullet skills, his one minute chess, and even shorter than that skills, which we will be discussing. But first, let's welcome him to the show. Thanks for doing this, uh, Grandmaster Andrew Tang. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for having me. My pleasure. I'm psyched, man. Now, first thing we got to say is there's noise in the background, listeners. (laughs) (laughs) Andrew's Twitch fans will already know that uh, he's got a lot of crickets in his area. He Mm -hmm. actually lives not far from me in Princeton, New Jersey, but somehow he has loud crickets and I don't. So there's nothing we can do about it. But just wanted to uh, let listeners know that that you're not uh, you're not losing your mind and that there's no. Yeah, (laughs) that it it, it is what it is. It is. so, Andrew, I was thinking that, you know, I uh, I had my own thoughts about what I wanted to talk to you about. And then we have like a Patreon page where listeners send in questions. Sure. But then I also wanted to get the temperature of the people since you're pretty popular. So I took to Twitter oh, okay. and asked uh, <laughs> and asked nice, for some nice. questions. And basically what we got, Andrew, is like 30 versions of the question, how are you so fast? Oh, so, okay. Which I'm sure is also what your Twitch streams are all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much so let's just get it out of the way. How are you so fast, Andrew? <laughs> I mean, I, it's a hard question to answer. Like a lot of things in board are kind of just like second nature to me now. Like obviously uh, I'm kind of famous for my mouse skills, which I've been developing since playing bullet for like over 10 years now i guess but like yeah there's a lot of other skills not just using the mouse that you need to be fast in bullet which people don't really often consider like being able to pre-move well anticipate what your opponents are going to try stuff like that even like reaction time but yeah uh, it's it's fascinating and uh I'd like to dig deeper, but hearing you mention that you've been playing Bullet for 10 years, obviously mm-hmm. you're a pretty young man, Andrew. So let's take it to the beginning. I mean, sure. I think a lot of us who grew up playing chess had our Bullet escapades, but when mm-hmm. did you realize, hey, I'm kind of good at this? Um, I have made my account on ICC at Penguin GM1, which is why I'm, I've kept this username for 13 years, I think. But yeah, somehow I got on ICC. I don't really, really remember how, and I... I, I started playing bullet. I discovered it like when I was nine, and then I just, I, I mean, I I just really liked playing it, and I I played kind of an unhealthy amount of it, but it is what it is. And and I was like I was like pretty pretty good very soon. I don't know, like I was always better than people my rating when it came to bullet, but I got better and better, I guess. So do you remember what your like what your regular chess rating was around this time and what mm. your bullet rating was? Um like I don't know, at at nine I was maybe like seventeen, eighteen hundred USCF or something. And my, my bullet was probably around like two thousand on ICC, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, yeah, and those ICC ratings, at least as I recall, they yeah. weren't they weren't so inflated like some yeah, of yeah, the Yeah, it was definitely like much more difficult than like 2000 on leeches. Yeah. And so was it the sort of thing, Andrew, where you're staying up, you know, past your bedtime playing bullet, your parents are yelling at you <laughs> to be either doing schoolwork or doing regular chess, or did you kind of have this, uh, this new interest under control? Actually, yeah, no, I, I was a pretty good kid, like um, always like sleeping at like 10 p.m., whatever, 11 p.m., even like through high school. But 
Um, I did play a lot like in the afternoons, but my parents were more or less okay with it as long as I was doing well in school, which I was. And it wasn't that that crazy of an addiction. I never really stayed up to like 5 a.m. playing bullet. So it's okay. okay, I think. Sounds it, sound... like, it was just like me only playing bullet and not like studying chess. Gotcha. Well, I was going to ask about that because obviously you're, you're an amazing slow slash classical yeah, yeah, player. Yeah too um but how did that mix in did you just like did you study much slow chess yeah so i mean i've had coaches for most of the time i've been playing but um i really never did very much serious studying on my own um i honestly just the way i improved mainly i say i'd say was playing online and playing otb tournaments and analyzing those games and and lessons that is mainly it but i think playing over the board is like the best form of practice by far yeah i think especially when you're like a rising kid mm -hmm. but yeah as you say like the t the fact of the tournament player i think that's something that um a lot of newer chess players or like in the online age people yeah, miss yeah. there's there's it's, something about tournaments that makes it stick yeah this yeah the atmosphere is just completely different you're completely focused and you definitely get a lot more out of the games instructively speaking yeah and and i i want to talk about your tournament career later but i figured we would go bullet sure. then blitz then slow chest sure. then life and then <laughs> and then then we'll let you go That's but awesome. um but speaking about bullets okay you realize you're a little better than your regular chess mm -hmm. um when did you kind of you you mentioned kind of the dark arts of like you know proper pre-move skills and um, you know there's all the dirty flagging stuff like when did you start to get into the weeds of like uh, really trying to extract every edge in bullet as opposed to just sort of playing for fun? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, like pretty soon I was like 22, 2300 plus on ICC. And like, I think it's just something like as a kid you pick up on very easily. It's, it's like an advantage I think I had over like, I don't know, older bullet players. Um, these like these just these tricks you pick up over the years you notice them you, you notice them more easily when you're younger too and then it's it, like I said earlier it's like just automatic sometimes for me now I don't know and what about obviously we got to talk about the legendary fast mouse the mouse mm -hmm. speed so we had a question on Twitter from uh, I am Ali Mordazavi who just wants to know what kind of mouse you have sure. something I'm sure you got asked all the time so yeah, let's yeah. let's cover that one too. Yeah, people are always like surprised when they ask me this and I tell them I got my mouse for $7. <laughs> oh, really? It was on sale from like $20 and I think for the price of it, it's a very good mouse, although they don't sell it anymore. It's called like the Ozio X01 or something. Okay. Um, I don't think it's extremely important to buy like um, a super, super expensive mouse for bullet, but What's more important is that you're very comfortable with your mouse. And I've been using this mouse for like, I don't know, at least five years or something. That's amazing. So first mm -hmm. of all, I'm, I'm shocked that there's never been any like rage breaking of a mouse in, <laughs> well, in all those years. Okay. It's not completely accurate to say I've been using this particular mouse for five years, but I bought backups. But I never uh, threw a mouse. I just like dropped it or spilled water. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we 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 see your dorm when you're streaming. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> um, uh, God. <laughs> but uh but it's still like has there have these been like bid up on eBay since you revealed what kind of mouse you use? Like are they are mm -hmm. other people thinking if I get that mouse, I'll you know, I'll, I'll be fast like Andrew. Honestly, yeah, I think that might be like a pretty big reason it went out of stock, but <laughs> they don't they don't make them anymore, so I, I, I managed to buy like three or four of them before they sold out. <laughs> good for you. Yeah. Hopefully you take take good care of them. Yeah. And of course, on your YouTube channel, which we should also mention, mm -hmm. I believe it's also Penguin GM1. Yeah. Um, you've got a few videos of you doing these mouse click games. Sure, sure. So obviously those are some of your most popular videos as far as I can see. Yeah. And I was curious, like, is that something you practiced to be faster? Or is that just something that because you're fast, you're also good at that? No, yeah, I mean, it's really mainly the skills I've gotten from Bullet. I don't know. Like, people from other games and communities, I've often, like, they've often told me that 
what what I can do as like a chess player. They're extremely surprised and impressed by because I don't know. I've I have very good mechanics apparently, like on par with other video game pros. So Interesting. Definitely, it's I don't know one of my special talents or something. So I never have really played like first person shooters like a lot of people or or anything. It is really mainly just chess is how I got good at using my mouse. Amazing. So for fellow old people like me, first person shooters are of course a type of video game. So have you played any any have you done any other sort of gaming uh along the way? Um there's this one game called Osu and it's it's like a rhythm game but it also involves aiming. So that does help your your aim, I suppose. And I also got into League of Legends recently after being signed with Cloud9. Their League of Legends team is the biggest team on the okay. organization. So I met some of the league players, but I'm not a very good player by okay. any means yet. <laughs> yeah. And shout out to Cloud9. It's awesome that they're supporting Thanks. a young, yeah, yeah. young really, chess talent like really yourself. Thankful. Yeah. yeah. And... You know, I interviewed at some point uh, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. I think you've had a battle or two with him along many, the way. Many. <laughs> and he he mentioned sort of like how one of his bullet skills, um, and probably uh, quite common at your guys' level, is he knows how many seconds he needs for a certain checkmate sort of thing, like so that um, on mm -hmm. a conscious level, sure. if you, you know, you know, a, a regular person might, I mean, I'm just going to use a very basic example, might with a king and rook against a king, you know, yeah. Need, yeah. need 10 seconds. You guys can probably do it in three mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But is that something that, that you've practiced? To, like, do you think about it consciously? And is it something like, have you practiced your conversion skills or is it again, just from learning by playing? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say like consciously think about it, but when I get down to a time scramble and I, I have this whatever kind of end game, I do have a good idea of whether or not I'll be able to convert it in time, but it's not something I consciously think about, I'd say. And it's, it's not something I've really practiced. I've just played very, very many bullet games, so I know how to do it well. Also, it, it does like depend on the website because on leeches you have zero second premiums which allows you to convert a lot more end games on yeah. chess.com like you you have a minimum of 0 0.1 seconds per move being spent on premiums so okay there's like so, a physical limit to what you can do right so just to explain for uh, the non-bullet wizards out there, zero second pre-move means if you pre-move and it's a legal move you'll have 0, 0.0 seconds taken off your clock Whereas Andrew's saying with chess.com, you will lose a tenth of a second, which obviously makes a, a huge difference. Now, Andrew, obviously you're on a short list of the best bullet players <laughs> in the world. Um, so I, I want you to do some power rankings, but, and obviously you can okay. punt, you uh -huh. can punt but, but I'd like to hear it. No, yeah, I, I get this question a lot. And I, I don't, I mean, at this point, I don't try to dodge it. Because oh, nice. I, I might as well. Uh, it's like very close between the top three. I'd have Magnus as number one, probably. And um, like I tend to say Ali Reza is second and Hikaru is third only because I don't see Hikaru play much bullets, so it's a lot harder to judge him. He doesn't play much these days. Okay. And Ali Reza did beat him in the last bullet championship on Jens.com. But like I think if Hikaru played more, he, he probably could be number one again and just... He doesn't really seem to like playing bullet that much anymore. And uh, between me, me and Daniel, we're four and five, but it's pretty close. Okay. And what's the story with uh, Mr. Orange Crush on uh, chess.com? Who? Isn't there a guy named Orange Crush who's also like right there on the oh, leader? He's I, in FM. He's only in I FM. See. This guy, yeah, I, I, he's like, he's like a, a hyper bullet or even okay. faster player for sure. So. I wouldn't say he's like a, a top bullet player, but obviously very good as well. Okay. And as you compare the skill sets of you guys, um, is there something that you're better at compared to your peers mm -hmm. and something you're worse at? Yeah, I mean, so obviously I'm I'm like faster, 
then the other is in the top five, I, I would say, and very, very good at converting end games. Um, I, I mean, the things the other people have that I don't are just pure chess skill, probably. I mean, Hikaru in particular, like, seems to outplay me all the time, but I mean, Magnus is the same. And then I do, like, manage to swindle them more often, but it's not like it's not like I, I, I don't win any games on the board, but they're obviously a little bit stronger. Yeah, I mean, no shame in saying that. Those guys <laughs> yeah. are monsters. I mean, I can't believe how good. I mean, I guess it makes sense. The best players are going to be the best bullet players. Uh-huh. But someone like Magnus, it's amazing to me that with all his responsibilities, he can still uh, yeah. parachute in and, and uh, yeah, brawl really with cool you guys. That he likes to just play. Yeah, and I know you mentioned in... Um, there was a nice write up uh, when you signed your deal with Cloud9, and you mentioned like, you know, it's an honor to get to play with Magnus, mm-hmm. and of course you got to play with play with him in the World Rapid and Blitz. And you mentioned that you know he messaged you after some matches. Um, so <laughs> I'm so I'm sure listeners would love to hear some uh, behind the scenes dialogue after these epic <laughs> matches. Um, yeah, I mean, we we've played like many hundreds of games and. Uh, apparently he watches my stream occasionally okay it's so, like i mean <laughs> he just messaged me on leech us a couple times after matches and we had some interesting conversations um the last one was him just like saying ggs or whatever and i asked if i could go to his birthday party since <laughs> my birthday is one day before his but it is like, unfortunately, I don't think you can come because of COVID. So, oh, bummer. Unlucky have, for me. Yeah, you'll have to wait out COVID. I'll try again. And amazing that you got to play him in the World Rapid and Blitz. I yeah, mean, I so, very lucky, yeah. And I assume you had already had some bullet encounters before then? Yeah, many. So, I'm pretty sure he knew who I was. Um, I should hope so, yeah. I was uh, very, very nervous that game. <laughs> and it, it showed a little bit, I think, but it was a very. Really, really cool experience. And was there much chat, like IRL, at that occasion? No, I didn't speak to him after the game, but after the tournament, I managed to get a picture with him. So that was okay. We had a little short conversation. And there's the picture that I think is in again in the Cloud Nine article, although maybe on your website or something of you guys at the board. Is that is that the one you refer to as being with him, or is that one that was just taken by the press there? Um. Yeah, I think it was probably taken by the press. I have like a personal just photo with him nice next to him on my Instagram. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. as yeah. you should. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you mentioned again in this article that your goal is to be the best bullet player in the world. Mm-hmm. When again, when I interviewed Danya, uh, he said to be the best bullet to be a better bullet player at the stage he's at, he needs to become a better chess player. Yeah. Um, do you feel that way as well at this point? Um, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with him. Uh, I feel like, you know, maybe if I gained a hundred classical points or something, like I'd have a like very good shot of being as good as the other top guys. Um, like, um, for the most part, bullet really is chess skill. Just, at your level. Yeah. Trust, trust me. I mean, <laughs> not at like, the lower levels, but yeah. Uh, people like to say bullet is not chess, but I mean... It's just it's just different from classical, obviously, but it requires a lot of chess skill for sure. And from like the speed perspective, like there's a limited amount more I can improve. So it's definitely where chess is definitely where I can make the biggest improvements for my bullet. Interesting. And so would you you said you're the fastest of that cohort of the mm-hmm. the uh, top six or so players that you named. Um, do you think you're just the fastest full stop in the world? Well, okay, N- not in the world, but like in time scrambles, I don't think anybody can combine being as fast and as precise as me. There will be people who are faster, but like if I can win material while playing almost as fast, then I will probably be able to outplay them in the end anyways, something like that. So it's a, it does require combination always. Okay. And getting back to what you had, what we were talking about a second ago with like you're needing to improve at slow chess, mm-hmm. I noticed 
and I want to talk more about slow chess later, but I noticed you still play, you know, you yeah. still, you still go to the world open and stuff like that. And obviously you're a junior at Princeton, you're a busy guy. Mm -hmm. um, so is that part of your motivation, like to improve your bullet or is it just like love of the game or do you have unfulfilled goals in classical chess? What's the primary driver? Yeah, honestly, I mainly just play for fun. I still enjoy playing classical chess a lot. And I mean, I, I try to play on my breaks when I can. Um, I mean, a long-term goal for now is 2,600, but it's not something like I would say I'm like fully dedicated towards or anything. If it happens, that would be wonderful. But yeah, I, I want to improve in classical and in bullet, but for the most part, like I would say school is more of my focus, so it's more for fun yeah but it's still to improve too that's cool yeah mm -hmm. and uh, again we might as well since we're here right now we got a bunch of questions um i know a uh, friend of the pod peter newhall sent one they're all asking about it and I, I know this comes up on your stream as well but your graduation plans compared sure. to professional <laughs> twitch streaming or you know getting a real job uh, uh -huh. as it were um yeah i mean so i graduate in two years which is really crazy to think about with covid it feels like i don't know i'm still a sophomore but obviously i'm a junior it's, it's just yeah you were robbed. It's, it's a little bit weird but yeah. yeah um i mean i i i have a degree so that will provide me like a lot of security compared to being a professional chess player if being a professional chess player is is like viable i mean it's obviously something i'm going to consider very strongly but also i'm considering going into trading um on trading i'm trying to get an inter internship with one of these trading firms this summer so okay i mean we'll see what happens if yeah it's, if it's I something would, i like to do yeah i, don't I, I would hire them if i were hire you if i were them <laughs> thank so, you thank although you. I, I hate to hate yeah. to lose you in the chess world now you know, you can pass on this, Andrew, if it's too personal, but obviously you do have this deal with Cloud9. Mm -hmm. You've got 50,000 Twitch followers. So if you were like, say, streaming slightly more often um, and not bogged down with school stuff, do you feel like your current chess career, would it be like viable right now? Um, I don't know. It's tough to say. I feel like I would w want a bit more security, which is why I like kind of do it part time. But it's also hard to like, you know, I mean, I often like wonder sometimes like what it would be like if I fully dedicated myself to my stream, but yeah, I, and just, I I really don't think like I want to drop out of college. So it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't advocate such a, anyway. I mean, but I was just curious, like mm -hmm. um, long term. And of course, it's been a crazy year and a half with so many. Well, not so many, really. It's really not so many. It's just. The ones that have blown up have really blown up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, the, I think the chess economy will still be healthy in a uh, year and a half to two Thanks, years, man. as you say. Um, so, Andrew, as as promised, I'm ready to trans. So we're going to slow down. We're going to take it from bullet chess to blitz. Sure. Um, but first, I want to take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood is a subscription video service by a team of GMs headed by Grandmaster Avchek Gregorian, who you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess. They offer a comprehensive video library featuring an opening repertoire for both colors, as well as courses on middle game and end game mastery. They also have great free content. Avtech has an insightful blog, and they have a YouTube channel featuring daily lessons with a grandmaster. 
So all the links you need if you want to find out more are in the show description or just go to chessmood.com and have a look around if you're interested. All right, so Blitz, um, we are back. Andrew, let's hear uh, the state of your Blitz game. How does it compare to your bullet? What, uh, what's going on? Are you making, making strides there? Or what, what's, the, what's the state of bullet? I mean, Blitz. Yeah, so obviously I'm not as good of a Blitz player as I am at bullet, but I think sometimes people underrate, underrate me as a Blitz player. Um, I've won a couple of titled Tuesdays. And I won uh, Leech's title arena in Blitz recently, so I think I think my Blitz has been improving. Um, definitely, like not like a top twenty Blitz player or something, but uh, with anybody, I think I I can compete really. Yeah, I mean, and you're only twenty one. I mean, mm-hmm. you're. you're uh... Yeah, still still room to improve there. So is that something that you work to improve as well, or is it kind of like the same conversation as before? You get better at the slowest form, and then the faster forms will come along? Yeah, honestly, it's it's pretty similar, I'd say. Um, I mean, I play Blitz occasionally online, but not nearly as much as Bullet, so it's mostly about improving in slow chess, I think, when it comes to getting better at Blitz, too. Okay. Now, obviously, you say, you know, you're not top 20 in the world, but still, of course, an incredible Blitz player. And Oops. with that in mind, we have a couple questions from mm-hmm. uh, supporters of the podcast. So uh, Patreon supporter Dapankar Gosh, uh, listeners, I mean, uh, people who subscribe on Patreon to Perpetual Chess can find out the guests and send in questions. So Dapankar has a few questions. And first, we're going to dive into this one, which is, what do you think contributes to this insanely quick tactical vision that you have in faster time controls? And do you have any tips for lesser mortals? Um, right. I don't know. I've always really been this is very good at spotting quick tactics. I mean, I feel like it's kind of similar in a way to my mental math skills. I've always been extremely fast at calculating. Um, I can do multiplication very quickly, like two by two multiplication, whatever. Also, it, it, it's like, you know, if you want to get better at it, you just need to get better at tactics too. But yeah, I think I I just am a very quick thinker in general. And that's that's the most important part. But improve your tactics and you'll you'll see them faster. Okay. And of course, again, you already mentioned when you were coming up, you mostly played competitively. Um, I've interviewed John Bartholomew a couple of times. He told a Mm -hmm. story about working with you when you were young. Um, So were you solving tactics puzzles at all or was it just uh, play and learn? Yeah. I I mean, all this is exposing how lazy I (laughs) I am really, but I never really did tactics on my own either. It's mainly just playing occasional tactics, but I wasn't a huge grinder of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and it's not unusual. I mean, Hikaru says the same sort of thing. It's, mm-hmm. um, it, it's interesting how, uh, how some people just, it, it comes easily to them. So in terms of your school subjects, Andrew, like sure. you mentioned, you were really good at mental math. Uh, yeah. Anything else you were particularly good at or particularly bad at that might surprise people? Um, I don't know if any of this is, super surprising i've been always like good at the sciences math in particular um i guess history is something i actually quite like which is kind of different while i really always never liked english literature stuff stuff like art i've been always very bad at art in particular okay i hated art in elementary school the most it's my least favorite subject for sure How's your penmanship? Uh, my handwriting's actually fine. I just, I can't draw for my life. Okay. Um, and we have another kind of similar question, but this one I think is more practical. Uh, this is okay. from a friend and supporter of the prod, Todd Bryant, also uh, known online as Strong Chess. He mm-hmm. says, I'm a lifetime time trouble addict, especially in Blitz, where I often find myself down buckets of time by the middle game. What do you recommend to correct this? Obviously, I need to move faster, but it's a very tough habit to break. Um, yeah, I actually get into time trouble a lot too. Um, a lot of, I think, good blitz bullet players kind of do that in classical too. Grishik is an extreme example. 
it's really hard to say anything besides just like force yourself to move faster and see how it goes you just need to force yourself to break the habit i feel like um oops that's that's really the only way to play faster is to play faster i think and you mentioned of the clock yeah yeah and you mentioned that it's something that that you're not you tend to get in time trouble now obviously you're amazing in time trouble so that helps but right. is it is it something that you work on or is it just like it is again it, it is what it is sort of thing yeah i tend to lean on my ability in time trouble too much sometimes so it comes and goes i feel like and then I remember I need to force myself to play faster. But recently, I think I've been doing better about forcing myself not to like blow 30 minutes on a move because it's just, it, it doesn't help even. Sometimes when you think too much, you just second guess yourself and it, it works worse than just moving. Yeah, that it, it makes sense. I And, you know, Todd wrote this question, but I could have written it myself. Uh -huh. um, but it, it is a genuine question from someone other than than me, who's always asking people how to avoid time trouble. Um, but let me ask you, Andrew, um, sort of on a related question, when you're playing Blitz, like how often are you thinking about pacing? It sounds like maybe not that much. Are you trying to keep up with your opponents on time? Are you trying to like not fall behind by a mm -hmm. certain amount? Honestly, it depends on the opponent sometimes. Like, I feel like if my opponent is a very strong chess player, I try to spend a lot more time in the opening slash middle game to get a good position because I feel like it's important for me to get a non-terrible position. And then going into the time scrambles, often I can convert my advantage if I get one. But... um. Yeah, against other players, I'll try to put them into time trouble. Like, it, it just it depends. I feel like. Uh, okay. Um. So, have there been like how has your blitz game progressed over the past couple of years? Are you getting better? Um. Do you feel mm -hmm. like? I feel like um, from like twenty eighteen to twenty twenty, maybe I didn't really improve much, but recently. Um, I've been winning some more blitz tournaments. I feel like I I've improved. Maybe, maybe I can, I don't know. I mean, I want to go back to like the world rapid and blitz. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. that. That That's really where I would like to do well. in. honestly. Yeah. So for listeners who don't know, that's like the big, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, FIDE World Rapid and Blitz, but it's a big World Blitz Championship, and it's every two years, correct, Andrew? Or is it every My year? I think it's every year, yeah. Okay. It's just, it, wasn't, it didn't happen last year because of COVID. Okay. And last I heard, there's been kind of um, radio silence from FIDE about, like, if anything's happening. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I have heard maybe in Russia. I don't know. I've... I don't, like really, <laughs> I don't have much information either, but I think they're often extremely late in announcing it anyways. It's and it's often annoying. around like Christmas time, right? Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's annoying because like it's not that easy to get a visa, so it'd be nice if they said it earlier. So I could plan, but we'll see what happens. But basically, if they announce it and it's not like two days before, you're going to probably you're gonna go. go. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's fun. I mean, it's so, it's so fun to see, obviously I, I just love that tournament generally, but especially yeah. like the online stars, like in the, in the flesh battling it out is a lot of fun. So that's, uh, that's good to hear. And it's good to hear that, um, that you're making progress in your blitz game. Mm -hmm. Um, so any, you know, before we move on to slow chess, any, any like practical blitz tips you could share, or is it just like all about doing? Like, do you review? Do you review your games on the um, algorithms, the game report on chess.com, and the computer analysis on Lee Chess after every blitz game? Yeah, I mean, well, not every blitz game, but like entitled Tuesday, I will between games. But honestly, that's mainly more out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I'm just. If I lose, I'll be annoyed and want to know where I could have played better. But um, the tips, like I don't know, it's it's good to to have. Honestly, like I think openings are kind of underrated. 
if you have like if you're able to play the opening very comfortably like that's that's pretty huge and that's yeah that makes sense and are you um a wide repertoire or a narrow repertoire guy when it comes to uh, play? yeah i'm i'm a pretty narrow repertoire i mean people like sometimes laugh at me for playing my classical repertoire in blitz but uh-huh i just do it <laughs> i mean yeah and in bullet anything goes yeah it's definitely much less important bullet i'd say Okay, and Andrew, we're recording this on a Tuesday. I saw that you were playing in Title Tuesday. Oh, uh, yes. So I went looking for your stream, and you, again, I'm a Twitch noob, so maybe I missed it. Were you streaming or no? No, I wasn't. Actually, okay. I was just, I was like, well, I was streaming it to some people in my Discord, just talking to a few friends. But Okay. Um, yeah, well, actually, I had class at 3 p.m. today, so... I was cutting it very close and I didn't want to <laughs> stream either because I didn't know if I would just leave the tournament. So yeah, I, I had eight out of nine actually and threw a winning position in round 10. It was very sad, but I managed to get to class on time. So it worked out. Yeah. And, frustrating though. Yeah. And what's, what's the first prize for money wise for? Title? 750, I think. Okay. So mm-hmm. how much are, are you thinking about the money as compared to you just want to be the one who won? Oh, I mean, well, I just play the tournaments for fun mainly. Although, I mean, <laughs> if I, I, I like the money. Yeah, of winning. course. Winning it isn't that important to me, I guess, either. So <laughs> I like the money, but it's more about just playing good players. Okay. Yeah. And there's been a lot of questions online, both like in the archives, um, a little bit on Twitter. Um, you know, you're kind of a, you're like a chess star, but it's this tiny universe. Mm -hmm. So how does that, uh, how does that equate to real life at Princeton? Do you have any street cred there? (laughs) Actually pretty funny, like freshman year. Um, I don't know, maybe one person in my hall, like, recognize me actually but like around campus like i mean like people might have heard of me or something but no one would like go up to me and be like hey are you andrew tang like whatever whatever but um so yeah i mean like it's something like my friends would like maybe tell other people about as like a fun fact but it wasn't like i was some celebrity either this year it's a little bit different because like it's been a week and a half and I think like six people have come up to me so far and just been wow. like, I know you from Twitch and everything. So you can just see the difference in how popular chess has become. It's very striking. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That, that's good to hear. And I'm sure the, again, the, the cloud nine deal probably didn't hurt. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm sure your, your Twitch is like multiples bigger than pre COVID. Uh-huh. Um, that's awesome. Um, all right. Well, it's time to get to classical chess, Andrew. But first, sure. we got to take one more break and uh, and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. So Andrew, I wanted to talk about classical chess, but honestly, I don't know what there's what there is to say that we haven't kind of already said. I mean, do you have any stories? Like, who's the who's the strongest player you ever played in classical chess? Uh right. Let's see. I have played Wesley So because um, he lives in Minnesota these days. Was it like a training game or a local game or? No, yeah, it was actually right before he he was adopted by his new family. He played this tournament in some small tournament in Minnesota. Some people, somebody invited him and he played, and I managed to get to play him that tournament. At the time, he was like low twenty seven hundred maybe, but he found his his new adoptive family at that tournament, I believe. So 
it's actually the start of something. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's history. Yeah. And then I've played Le Quang, Liam, I think. He's probably the other super GM I've played who was a super GM at the time I played him. Yeah. And I played like people like Ferruja, but they just weren't like you know as strong as they are now so yeah that and uh just i should explain the wesley so thing a little bit just for listeners who aren't uh familiar so wesley so emigrated from the philippines um to the united states and eventually sort of uh became close with a family based in minnesota as andrew says and uh lives with them and considers them like his own family so andrew was saying he was there for that um now hearing you mention playing laquang liam um what was how did that game go, Andrew? I got completely crushed. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a high rated I am, I think, at the time, but I, yeah, I just got crushed. Okay. Got... Yeah. No again, no shame in that. We're talking about mm-hmm. a top twenty five, top thirty player um in the world. Was it like an opening thing or uh a calculating thing? Was there like a lesson to extract from it? Yeah, it, it kind of was an opening thing. Um at the time, I really didn't know how to play against the London, and he just completely like destroyed me in some attack, as that happens in the London sometimes, which is funny because now I play the London a lot myself, and I've used it pretty successfully against some decent players. <laughs> so, if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, we have another question from Dipankar Ghosh who asks, he says, what role would you say your coaches have played in your chess journey to become a grandmaster? And he says, feel free to name some of them if you'd like. Well, yeah, everybody knows John. He shaped me a lot as a positional player. Um, I, I don't know, like before master, I was a very tricky kind of player, I'd say. But then my style really, really just became like, a bit different i'm a very i would say i definitely like lean positional in terms of my play style now and john definitely had an influence on that and also my coaches have influenced my openings a lot too like john taught me e5 against no scandy i thought you were gonna say scandy he tried <laughs> to teach me as like a as another option i i never got to learning it and also my current coach nicola mitkoff um he helps me a lot with the openings and i definitely yeah and how frequently are you repertoire to thank from him a lot but yeah how how frequently you're taking lessons with nicola uh yeah it's it's a lot less frequent when i'm in school so okay not much but yeah i try to work with him when i'm playing tournaments for example and let me ask you about John, because the, the most recent time I had him on the show, I asked him, like, so when you were teaching Andrew, when did you say, oh, hold on, <laughs> this kid might be something. Mm-hmm. And John, of course, has become like legendary Internet teacher in addition to a chessable yeah, co-founder. It's, it's so were you like, this guy's amazing <laughs> like right from the beginning? Or was it just like he's your chess teacher? You don't think about it that much. And obviously that wouldn't be like a big criticism if you said that. Well, I mean, obviously I thought he was a very good teacher. I, I I would definitely recommend him to anybody. Definitely, he's super super good at explaining things. But I never like would have expected both of us to become I don't know celebrities kind of online. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, neither yeah. of us were particularly well known before it, when we started working together. So yeah, Minnesota punching above its weight. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. Um. Excellent. Well, I don't know. So, Andrew, I was going to talk more classical, but I really don't know what that is to say. So one thing I mentioned when I emailed you is, Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just have any stories, you've got these epic blitz matches, you know, one, I mean, bullet matches, excuse me, like one, one, like three hour one with Hakaru that's got a ton of views on YouTube. But like, what's your longest bullet session? Um, Me and Daniel once agreed to play. Now I'm forgetting how many games it was. It was like supposed to be a 200 bullet game match to start, but I think we ended up playing more. <laughs> I'm forgetting now. But yeah, we we were just like, let's play 200 games. And, and these are one play. minute. Yeah. So okay. it, it was it was many hours. Yeah, sure. we're talking 400 like minutes give or take. Yeah. Hours. And then mm-hmm. we played more, and I I was like 4 a.m. at the end. I, we were both streaming, so 
definitely that was the longest match. And that was probably, I mean, it must have been fairly recent, last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty recent. What was your What was your first bullet encounter with Danya? Do you remember? I don't know if we ever played on Leech. Uh, sorry, ICC, but actually, I'm not sure. I mean. Yeah, I'm really not sure. We didn't play very really in the old, old days, I would say. Okay. And I asked Danya about this a little bit, well, but what's the sort of etiquette with rematches? Like when you play one of these other elite bullet players, if you play one game, is it like automatically going to be a match? How does that sort of thing work? Yeah, I mean, you know, usually if you have to leave soon, it's considered good form to tell your opponent about that. Um, when, when we play, we generally, uh, at least like, I don't know, 30 games or something, <laughs> but uh, if either of us have something we know in advance, we'll say it usually, okay. but yeah. And you mentioned Magnus, when, you, when you messaged, he just straight up messaged you on Lee chess. Um, mm-hmm. are a lot of you like I aming on Facebook or like, you know, um, are there, are there other ways you guys text back and forth during these matches? I actually no. I wish I had Magnus's phone number, but I don't. Yeah, I don't. Man. I don't. I don't really have these guys' numbers or anything. That's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, that's crazy. Um, and so, what's your most memorable match? When, like, say you have grandkids someday, what, what's the first thing you're going to tell them about? Um, in terms of like your online escapades. Yeah, it'll definitely have to be like you know any of my matches with Magnus. But I have another like funny story. Like the first time he was playing on Leech as um he was playing anonymously and I was playing this this guy without a title or anything on Leech S and he was out playing me in one minute bullet and I was like, Who is this? I, I thought it, it must be a cheater. It felt like a cheater because the moves were very strong. Um yeah, and generally I have a pretty good eye for this, I think. So I reported him to Leeches, and then Leeches like responds back like 24 hours later. Uh, we we have an idea on this person, and we believe he is not cheating. And then, <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing ever. Once I found out it was Magnus, like <laughs> like a month later. But <laughs> that's, uh, that's my first encounters with Magnus and Bullet. Actually, I just and- thought he was a cheater. How in one minute chess, how big an issue is cheating? Like it's so fast. Yeah, so this is one of the very nice things about bullet. Like it's definitely a lot harder to cheat convincingly in bullet than it is even in blitz. Because generally it's just it, it becomes more obvious as you play like a lot of bullet games when somebody's cheating. So that's a huge plus, I think. Okay. And you know, I again on one of your YouTube streams, I saw Thebo, the founder of Lee Chess. Mm-hmm. Um, was one of the people who donated to the stream. So uh-huh. if if you raise the red flag about someone cheating, do you have like a direct line to, to Thebo or is it just like run it up the flagpole like everyone else? No, yeah, I, I just report them. I mean, I don't I, won't, I don't want to be annoying and waste his time with, with the report. <laughs> There's like something particularly egregious. I mean, I I, I kind of know like a mod maybe, but... I mean, it's like, you know, they they can review the case manually, but I don't really try to cut in line, I would say, generally. That's that's nice of you, I would say. Thank um, you. And so I, sh- I feel like I sort of should know this, but it's not like when there's a big six-hour bullet match with Danya or Magnus or whoever it is, it's not the same thing as like looking up the result on you know you know in the Grinky classic or whatever like it takes some doing to figure out who won like so have you won bullet matches against magnus i again I, apologies that i should probably know this no it's all good um so recently i played him in the katara bullet tournament on lee chess and this is like the first time i've ever really beaten him in a match um it's like a short match though so i don't think i've ever been leading against magnus over more than like 20 25 maybe 30 games but like over over the long term obviously he's always going to beat me because he's just better but i've beaten him a couple shorter matches um okay and so if you played 100 i mean i guess 
you know, if he played enough bullet, obviously this would be mm. like mathematically yeah, yeah, exactly. derivable. But if you played him a hundred games, what do you think your like expectancy sure. would be? Yeah, I think like forty percent is pretty wow. Reasonable. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. <laughs> um, and and I mean, whatever you already gave the ranking, so we can extrapolate from there. Yeah. Um, okay, we got a few. We've got a few um, quick hitter type questions from Twitter. So. Ultra Zach asked a two-word question, which was browser tabs. <laughs> so, <laughs> what could you say about and and my again my not being a big Twitch guy, I just saw your most recent stream and uh-huh. saw that, that people were commenting on the lack of browser tabs. So that's yeah. the only context I have. Usually, I have like I don't know a hundred tabs open on average. It's just it is what it is. My computer can handle it, and I'm extremely lazy, as we've already established. <laughs> so. That's just it. I mean, and what sort of stuff are you into? What I mean, uh, you know, I don't think any children are listening, so you can no, say any- it's, <laughs> it's not really suspicious activity. I just like browsing lots of different websites, and then I don't delete the tabs. Okay, and yeah. as you mentioned, you might be interested in becoming some sort of like quant trader. Uh-huh. Your operations, research, and financial management uh, major, as your Mubot on Twitch says. Um, do you have, like, you mentioned an interest in history. So do you have other stuff you're reading about that's not, like, uh, school-related? Uh, I should get back into reading, but... Well, I mean, that's the browser tabs. I'm not so okay. much talking about books. Uh, okay, I mean, it's pretty random. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, like, whatever is going on currently in, like, different communities I follow, like like League of Legends, for example, is a recent addition I've I've been following. Um, like to watch the Cloud Nine team stuff. Okay, like that. but I, I, I don't know. I just the internet is very random. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and again, hearing you talk about Cloud Nine and the League of Legends, like I know a lot of chess players feel like they have sort of addictive personalities, mm. and and some some I know like would steer away from a video game for that reason because like. They feel like there might be an opportunity cost in terms of like uh-huh. whatever it is you're trying to achieve academically or what you're trying to achieve in chess. Do do you have any of that when it comes to like your sort of passing or growing interest in League of Legends? I think you know, I definitely kind of have an addictive personality, sure. But like in the end, I always just manage to scrape by and make sure my work is done. Like that is priority i mean i will waste a lot of time playing games but i I do procrastinate a lot but i always manage to make sure i will finish because like there are consequences yeah to not not doing your work yeah eventually outweighs the not wanting to do work in my brain gotcha yeah and obviously Princeton is um, an elite elite university here in the U.S. And you sort of mentioned in chess, it came relatively easy to you. You played a lot. You put a lot of time in, but didn't study. Sure. Would you say it's the same with schoolwork or are you like industrious when it comes to school? Uh, well, like all the way through high school, like honestly, school isn't very hard for me. Um, yeah, in high school, like I still had a lot of time to stream and play chess and do whatever and do fine, do well in school. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, homework was not hard, but college is definitely like a step above high school. That's for sure. I can't just get by without, you know, actually watching, paying attention and lecture or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's just harder for sure. Um, so I, I, yeah, I have to work. Okay. And Princeton, of course, at least over the years, has had a few famous professors. Have you had any that are mm-hmm. like, famous like uh you know for for their books and stuff um like yeah i've i mean i I, a lot of my professors have like wikipedia pages whatever i think probably the most notable is my econ professor alan blinder right now oh yeah he was like work for the fed or something yeah yeah former whatever i forget exactly what it was but he's quite quite well known yeah um yeah it was amazing and i know paul krugman was there for a while mm-hmm. although i can't keep track of if he's still there um okay another one that i had to look up myself andrew to get the context i have to confess but uh 
Ultra Vinny on Twitter. What the heck does C9, 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 C9 mean? Well, obviously, it's a reference to Cloud9, but more specifically, um, is one of the League of Legends players, usernames on League of Legends, one of the Cloud9 players at the time. So I took his username, and I, before my site, like, before they were going to announce me, I wanted to create interest uh, by getting this new account to number one on Lee Chess and that uh-huh. because people nice. were like, who, who is this person? A lot of people thought it was Magnus and maybe Magnus was signing with Cloud9 or something. So I, I led people on a little bit of a, a scavenger hunt and it was good for, for generating a little bit of attention. Nice. And yeah. again, I'm probably showing my age here, but is like, is Cloud9 synonymous with C9 or was there like, a, okay. Yeah, that's like, that's the abbreviation. So it's okay. It's the C9 repeated five times. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's intuitive that the C could be yeah, nine, yeah, yeah. but I just didn't know if people actually like called yeah. it that before then, or if there was like a tiny element of, uh, of mystery. Um, okay, Andrew, I'm almost out of questions, but this, this has been amazing to hear your stories. I got a couple okay. from, uh, from supporter of the podcast, Cody Noble, who always does his research and has good questions. Nice. So, um, number one was he found an article online that I actually had also come across, uh, where you, it talked about you and your Princeton chess team, which I know mm-hmm. they have a pretty strong team, yeah, yeah. uh, visiting a prison. So, right. Cody asks, uh, could you tell us a bit about playing an assignment against maximum security inmates at the New Jersey State Prison? How did your thoughts about what the event was going to be measure up against how it actually went? Um, and then there's a follow-up, but let's start with that. Honestly, like, I don't know. I didn't really <laughs> know what to expect going in. Like, I, I, don't know. I was just hoping it would be, it'd be a fun time and they wouldn't be scary and turned out to be pretty accurate uh, they were all they were they were quite funny um the inmates a lot of them were joking around and it was just, it was a good time all around honestly i also remember the prison just was extremely cold but okay it was just, just it was nice to interact with them and give them something interesting to do that's nice and and how were their chess games there were a couple that were actually pretty decent um, obviously a lot of beginners too, but yeah, I, I was impressed by a couple of them. It was not super easy to beat. So okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And Cody's follow up was, uh, did the Princeton students have a chance to go over any of the games with the challengers or was it strictly limited to the simul games? No, I don't, I don't really think we, uh, did analysis. Yeah. There were a lot of players. So like we just kept playing and we gave them multiple rounds sometimes too, but not really any analysis. I mean, okay. Maybe some people would, would would talk to the inmates briefly, but not like any analysis sessions or anything like that. Okay, um, and actually, uh, there's a couple more Twitter questions before we sure. get back to to Cody's other question. Do you ever play Bullet on your phone? And if so, how does it oh. compare to playing on your computer? That's from Simon at Green Hope Productions. I play Bullet on my phone very rarely. I used to do that when I was in high school, because well, not my phone, but my iPad, because. The titled arenas would start, I think, at 3 p.m. my time, and my school ended at 2.50, so I would have to play on the car home before I could get on my computer every every titled arena. Okay, it's, so... It's not terrible, but I think, I, for me, it's like a 100-point handicap. Maybe. Oh, that's not so bad. Yeah, there, yeah. Are, there are people who are extremely good at using like their phone to play bullet. Yeah, but I mean, I, I know think, Magnus has some epic stories of like being on a boat or whatever and just yeah, crush, yeah. crushing people. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, okay, I mean, and some, yeah. go ahead. It's just Sorry. a little less precise. I, I okay, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and someone online, and I can't find the question, but someone had asked about your your blindfold ultra bullet skills, which listeners who who haven't sure. seen who haven't seen this, it's it's out of this world how how well Andrew plays like in milliseconds without seeing the board. So was, I I feel like having talked to you, I feel like I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway, was the blindfold skill something you cultivated or did it come relatively naturally to you? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty natural. I don't know exactly when I was able to, but as a kid, I would read chess magazines a a lot before bed as kind of some bedtime reading. And I would just do that without a board. So it helps train your, calculation visualization 
at some point I was able to play blindfold. I mean, and now all my blindfold skills are pretty good. I can combine it with ultra bullet, which I'm quite good at too. And it works out pretty well for me. Yeah. It's a sick parlor <laughs> trick. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you ever like, okay, at Princeton parties, do you ever find yourself doing like chess tricks? I'm sure your <laughs> friends are trying to get you to do them. I've definitely like played people at parties before. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, are they making you like stand on your head and play blindfold and stuff or you I, know, I, beer, beer bongs? <laughs> I, I tried to play a simul blindfolded once, but didn't go that well. <laughs> uh, it's something that you kind of need to practice, I feel like. But yeah, there is some some wild chess going on at the Princeton parties. <laughs> I'm sure there are. Yeah. Um, tr- tr- true to the Princeton stereotype. Of course. <laughs> um, so it's just, so bullet, I mean, blindfold, it's just never any training. I mean, you, you already said this. It's just, there's a, I have an element of disbelief because because <laughs> when I watch you, it's, uh, it, it's incredible. So you haven't well, practiced it at all, basically? I mean, it is like practicing to, to try to read like chess articles without a board i mean i wouldn't say that's not training but yeah it's it's not like something you practice otherwise though okay um and the the second question from cody noble was um have you and again we've touched on this stuff before but still it'd be interesting to hear you address it directly which is he asks have have <clears throat> excuse me how have your chess goals evolved since graduating from high school he you read it. He read an article where you stated you would like to make a twenty seven hundred ELO rating, um, but then of course more recently you said you want to be the best bullet player in the world. So are, would you say you're more focusing on one discipline mm-hmm. over the other? Uh, so like while I was like still in high school, like I had a very very clear goal and it was grandmaster. Afterwards, um, I don't know. I had a rough gap year when I was just playing tournaments a bit and relaxing at home so just not enough it's progress a, I mean, yeah I, I feel like i had a bit of setback and like 2700 is obviously not easy at all and requires more dedication that i i would be able to put in so you know, best bullet player is definitely something more realistic i guess i would say but to be the best bullet player, you need to get better at yeah. slow chess. Um, although I don't know if like 2,700 is necessarily required for that. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and you mentioned kind of a, a rough gap year. Was it just the results weren't what you wanted or like just like being still with your parents? And, and w- I'm also curious when you took the gap year, like yeah. was there some thought this might be more than a gap year or was it definitely just going to be one year? No, I was, it was pretty, pretty certainly going to just be one year, but um, it's, I didn't mind living with my parents. That wasn't really a problem. I just, yeah, I played very poorly for a few months and it was kind of strange. I lost a lot of rating, which I had to recover, which I mainly recovered by the end of the year, but I don't know. It was a bit disappointing that like for a few months, I just felt like I couldn't play properly. Huh. Yeah, uh, maybe. Do you feel like you were like pressing because of the gap year? I guess maybe like there were some things that were going on, and then like also, I I don't know. I really wanted to gain rating. Often I feel like when I don't have expectations, I play better. So maybe there's something to that. Actually, I don't know. Okay. When I set very high expectations, I've often not not met them. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, most 21-year-olds would, would trade places with you, so <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't feel too bad. Well, that is um, maybe fair. So um, uh, one other question I just saw, okay. and again, this is one that maybe we can't do on an audio-only podcast, but uh, Kev Gill said any special mouse techniques. So uh, <laughs> you know yeah. that might be very hard to explain, but even if you could like point someone towards a resource or – I mean, it sounds like it's mostly au natural, but <laughs> – if you have any tips no yeah i mean i'm i i mean when i play these aim training games like it's impressive to people so that's i mean that's mainly the only tricks i have okay i don't and know the, to, to get better at using your mouse you should just play these kinds of games or use your mouse a lot it's just something you develop like anything else i think okay all right um and basically, last thing. So, 
FIDE World Rapid and Blitz. Everyone needs to, if that happens, fingers crossed, mm -hmm. check for you and root for you. Are you playing you. like National Chess Congress? Any any uh, any tournaments on the horizon? Yep. Yeah, so there's the Eastern Chess Congress in Princeton. So I'm very likely to play in oh, that. Oh, cool. It's like a mile away. Yeah, I'll probably see you there. And uh, yeah, uh, there's the National Chess Congress. It is something I'm definitely thinking about playing because Philly's, Philly's quite close as well. Besides cool. that, and we'll see what happens. Maybe something over winter break. Those okay. are the two I'm thinking about playing in. Okay, and then school-wise, just grinding your work and looking for an internship in the summer? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going through interviews right now, so it's actually kind of a bit of a busy time, but hopefully I'll be done done with that soon. <laughs> nice, yeah, cool. Well, it makes me all the more appreciative that you. Uh, it's... that you took that you took the time to do this. So thanks a lot, Andrew. I'm excited to see uh, where where life takes you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible, most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy. I also would like to thank everyone who helped spread the word about the show. Did you guys know that there's still people who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast? There's even chess players who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast. So we need to fix that. And the ways to do that include writing positive reviews on podcast platforms or YouTube comments telling friends, all that stuff makes a difference in helping spread the word about the show. But of course, I most of all want to thank people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So without further ado, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Heath, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Farhan Thawar, Barasawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsythe, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, The King's Crusher YouTube channel, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Grandmaster Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flummins, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue. Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio K. Leonfort, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard, Lynn, Brian, Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Pats of Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach J's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Tennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Padilla, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Francis Latart Lavoir, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovach, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastio, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Takumos, 
Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe Dasano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kravutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanovas, aka Photo Chess, Mark Shaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovic, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negmat Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Blaine, Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited of Switzerland, Randall Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel and Publishing Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatev Abrahamian, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks to you all for the support, and we will catch you all next week.